Hey, welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. My name is Mike Berninski, and soon to be sharing this split screen with me is Senator Paul Ciccarella, uh, representing the mighty 34th Senatorial District. Before Paul, uh, Paul comes on camera, I wanted to introduce you to him by reading some lines from his, uh, his website. Some folks in Wallingford don't know Paul. So Senate Republican Whip Paul Ciccarella was elected in 2020 to serve in the state Senate representing the 34th district, including the towns of Durham, East Haven, North Haven, and Wallingford. He serves as the leading Republican on the legislature's Housing and Veterans Affairs Committee. He also serves on the legislature's Appropriations, Judiciary, and Public Safety and Security Committees. Paul is a small business owner, retired corrections officer, and youth sports coach. There's more to read on Paul's website, um, certainly more to learn about him and all the members in the state legislature. But without further delay, let's get to talking to Paul Ciccarella. Hey, Paul Ciccarella, thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show. Uh, welcome aboard. I think this is the first time you've made an appearance here. Yeah? Yes, it is. And thank you for having me. Well, it's uh, it's it's our pleasure. Hey, um, we got a lot of items on our agenda list on our the topics to talk about. So I want to get right down to it. And one of the things that's concerning a lot of people, particularly this winter, are news reports about spikes in electricity costs. That when folks around the state get their electricity bill, they're gonna they're gonna be shocked, is what the news reporting says. So I wanted to get your, you know, your perspective on it. But before you start in, uh, bear with me for a minute, because I wanted to just read some material to sort of set the table for our viewers, add some context. And this comes from the Hartford Current, December 4, which is yesterday. We're, we're recording this on, uh, on Monday. But the headline was, Connecticut is bracing for the January 1 electric rate hike. Customers have short-term options, but officials say long-term changes are needed. And the lead sentence, with sharp electricity rate increases less than one month away, state officials are scrambling to try to soften the blow for ratepayers as they approach the cold winter months. Starting January 1, the state's two largest electric utilities will be enacting 100% rate increases, not on the entire bill, not on the entire bill, but on the generation portion of the bills that will hike costs, ready for it? Hike costs by about 85 a month for the average Eversource customer and nearly 80 per month for United Illuminating. That increase, or the increases, uh, says the Hartford Current, can be traced all the way back to the state's switch to electrical deregulation that was approved in 1998 under then Governor John G. Rowland deregulation reduced the powers of state officials to set electrical rates and open the market to a wide variety of electrical generators who sell power on a competitive basis. Last sentence. Consumers started shopping around to get discounted rates from a variety of, from a variety of providers, but many ratepayers eventually gave up over the years after receiving short-term rates that were suddenly increased when their low rate expired. Um, again, from the Hartford Current, but another article, it says, by law, the utility companies, they buy power from the generators, from the generating companies, but they can't make a profit on that, or they're not, they're not supposed to. And continuing on, Lamont, the Lamont administration worked with Eversource and United Illuminating to come up with some near-term relief, Eversource will contribute 10 million to the to the problem, and and UI will contribute at least three million. Um, I'll take it from here. Just how do, how do you see sort of the long-range problem? Uh, any hope for a long-range stabilization of, of the issue, uh, in addition to the short short-term fixes? Take it away. Thank you. So yeah, that, that's a huge problem coming at a terrible time. Um, so it's kind of a, a one-two punch, if you will, on our pocketbook, which is already depleting quickly from you know, national issues that are affecting 
everyone from inflation, the price of gas at, and our you know cars, heating oil, and now the electricity. Um, and, and it's a huge problem. Um, you know, when they merged Pura, Pura and Deep um, way back when, um, that's the start of this problem. You know, um, I think that the legislators that go up there to be the voice of the people um, should be talking about the things that directly affect their constituents. And this is one of them. And there are talks of, you know, taking Pura out of Deep and, and putting this hopefully back into the hands in some capacity uh, as legislators to have decisions um, made that will hopefully take away some of this burden um, because we need a long-term plan. Somebody getting $10 off their bill, um, and you spoke of some of the money that they were going to kick in, a couple million and eight million from another um, the other company, that's small. Um, and easily, easily um, another cost or a line item on your bill could pop up that would then uh, um, get, make them whole on that, that small investment that they're going to make to try to help us. But again, it's a very small amount um, and you know, 80 or $90 all at once. Some people live paycheck to paycheck. This is a problem. And we already have too many other problems, you know, on the backs of our constituents that it needs to be addressed. We need to talk about this. There needs to be a very serious conversation had um, and we need to determine a solution soon. Is there, are there good guys in this story and bad guys in the story? Um, are there bad actors? Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking finger point. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm talking about. We don't know what the solution is and we don't know, you know, what what lever to pull, what screw to turn. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think transparency uh, needs to be had. Um, I think that's where the good guys and the bad guys, their true colors, you know, will be seen. You know, we have some um, <coughs> municipalities that produce their own electricity um, and, and distribute it. And in Wallingford is a great example. Their, their rates are controlled. Um, you know, at the end of the day, no matter what happens, they make a 9% profit after paying their bills, paying their staff, they get to make 9%. Um, and some people have very, very large salaries and bonuses, all of those things um, that, that go along with running a business. Um, when the bills are higher, the end user is going to feel that burden. Where in Wallingford, they're doing it um, cost effectively. And I think that's where we need to have that transparency to see where's the money going and how do we reduce it? You know, it is more expensive to create the electricity. Um, it, simply put, it is more expensive. So clearly it's costing them more and we are <laughs> the ones that are feeling that burden. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, they're making their money. They're going to make that money no matter what the cost is. And, it's at, it's at the expense of, of the taxpayers and the constituents. So transparency uh, is not the same as re-regulation. I just want to make sure, you know, I, I'm, I'm clear on sort of where you're walking with this. Sure. sure. So when we're having conversations in the people's building, which we, we, we have to make sure we're getting back, uh, back to work and in person, we'll maybe touch base on that soon. But when we're having these conversations, there is transparency. So by possibly taking that, that deregulation or, or separating Pura uh, and Deep or, or putting it back on the legislator's plate to, to make some decisions, there is transparency. There's pu public hearings. We talk about it on the floor and our constitu constituents can see what's going on and the conversations that are being had um, where we're not in the boardroom. We're not really seeing everything. I um, mean, I think that that right there will, will help for sure. Yeah, I want to read um, a little bit from an op-ed piece that appeared in the Hartford Current, authored by the CEO of United uh, Illuminating. And probably United Illuminating and Northeast Utilities may feel like they're under the gun or, and, and maybe the target of some criticism Maybe, maybe warranted. I, you know, I, I have no opinion on that. But it's to be expected that they would uh, be somewhat what I what I think is somewhat defensive and say, well, you know, hey, it's not our fault. Here's what he wrote: it says electric generator supply costs 
have risen more than 150% over the last three years, enriching the generators, not UI or Eversource, but he's, he writes, enriching the generators at the expense of Connecticut families. The realization of lower electric supply costs for residents has clearly not materialized. The energy market structure in the state and New England is irrevocably broken. So he's pointing it at the generators as maybe profiteering, but other reading that I think maybe we've all done, the price of natural gas, because a lot of these are gas fired, natural gas fired and uh, liquefied natural gas uh, fired generation plants, they buy at the global price and they're gonna, you know, they gotta pass that along and make a markup on it. And so they, you know, everyone is, people are pointing to the price of natural gas globally. If that's the issue, can that ever be fixed? Well, I think that's part of the issue, right? Um, and I think that where we are located and not having a direct pipeline of natural gas here, getting it to us is a little bit more expensive. But, you know, if we take a look at, um, you know, Wall a Wallingford Electric um, customer and we see what their bill is going to look like in a few months and we take a look at UI, they're doing the same thing. Um, and it's not going to be as much of, of, of an increase um, for the Wallingford Electric customers. So I think we need to take a page out of their, their playbook. Um, they have to produce the energy the same exact way um, the other utility companies will. They're going to be purchasing from these generation generators. Um, and yes, it's it's more expensive to do business across the board, and that doesn't uh, change for producing the energy. Um, but clearly, you'll see a difference, and I think we pay attention to what those differences are. Yeah. I want to throw some terms at you and get a quick reaction, like a negative or positive. It's sort of a game. Uh, I think you'll you'll see where I'm where I'm going. I'm going to list some things, that, and, I, and I want some reaction. Okay. Uh, short answers, if you want, or long. Green power. The solution. So um, this is a good one. Green power is great. Um, I think it could be a solution. I'm hoping in the near future, but unfortunately, it is not right now. I think any clean energy options that's cost efficient for the end user is a no brainer. Years ago, it was a, a, a crazy to believe that we would have cell phones that could do so much. As time goes on and they master the craft, I think that's a great option, but it's not right now. More nuclear. We need to find a way to produce safe, clean energy. Uh, I think that's going to make it more affordable. Um, and I do think with, again, the way um, we learn from mistakes and as time goes on, I think there are safe ways to produce that type of energy. Um, but you know, it's something that we would we would have to to think about. Yeah. So, just an aside, I'm I'm making a note to myself to maybe send a a memo off to Mayor Dickinson to see if he can find a location in Wallingford for a nuclear plant, and he'll refer to that to a Jim Seichter of the Planning and Zoning Commission. They probably have a site in mind now that the uh, the data centers are probably not coming to anyway. I I, I dwell. I wander. So, okay, more uh, more pipelines. Uh, I think that, yes, I, I think more pipelines uh, are the answer to getting, um, you know, these these resources efficiently, effectively, and in and, and a cost-effective manner. Um, I, I think it is an option, yes. Coal. Um, yes, I think that, you know, you know, when we talk about our carbon emissions, we reduced our carbon emissions well uh, uh, before we, we were supposed to hit our, 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 you know, our levels. We're doing a good job of that. Um, and, and I don't think we just say, let's start getting rid of coal until there's something that could replace it and, and do it as, as effective and as cost efficiently. Um, so there is a place for all these things that we're talking about. And I think it needs to be a balance of, of where we use them and where we start to phase certain things out. And I think we need to take all things into consideration when we do that. I know that wasn't the, the, the object of the game because those are pretty long responses for a yes or no, um, but uh, I think it was important that we, we we talk about those things and that's what needs to happen. Okay. I'm off the game. The game has ended. You you get a you know passing grade. You're welcome. <laughs> so um, what remedies 
has the legislature enacted or they're going to enact? Um, what does that look like and how substantial might the aid be? Um, when it comes to what? I, I apologize. Uh, um, help for fuel bills, help for electricity bills, so that kind of thing. When it comes to energy, um, we just went back in a special session, and part of that was talk about some of the energy assistance programs that are out there. Um, you know, the federal government um, kind of funded it at a lower level than it has in the past, which doesn't make sense because, you know, we are now um, coming into a cold winter, um, and the, the price of fuel is almost double from what it was last year. So um, to underfund that, that was irresponsible in my opinion. Um, before the session was out, we tried to address this, and unfortunately, um, you know, it, it didn't happen. So we had to come in a special session, and now we were able to provide some uh, additional assistance to try to, to flat fund, if you will, um, you know, that energy assistance program. Um, but I think still more needs to be done. Let's change the subject. Um, it's been reported, uh, and I'm taking this now from, again, the Hartford Current, that uh, you've taken some measures about the gasoline tax and um, premium pay for essential workers. And I wanted to discuss that with you. I want to read a little bit first from the November 28 edition of the Hartford Current. It says the state legislature voted overwhelmingly Monday to extend the gasoline tax cut and free public buses, saying that cash strapped consumers need extra spending money into 2023 on a bipartisan vote of 134 to 7, the State House of Representatives said they were providing relief to taxpayers. And then more than four hours later, the Senate, you voted 33 to 0 uh, to support the, the same, uh, same measure. Um, under the bill, the temporary cut in the gasoline tax of 25 cents per gallon will now be extended through December 31, rather than ending on December 1. The tax will be phased back in over five months. Republicans though, your side, said that the full 25 cent cut on the gasoline tax should be extended until the end of the fiscal year on June 30, because the projected surplus for the fiscal year is 2.8 billion, that's a B, potentially the second highest in state history. So um, on the gasoline tax, uh, sort of walk me through how you see what you've accomplished. And if you hope to get more, well, tell us about that. Sure. So that was something that was proposed by Republicans to uh, give that gas tax holiday, if you will. Um, we saw that there is um, an increased amount of tax collection due to the price of gas. Again, now you have us paying more at the pump than we're going to be paying more taxes. And we thought it would be a smart move considering it's extra found money and we are in a very um, good spot when it comes to tax revenue that we could give that back to our constituents who, again, are struggling. You know, it is extremely expensive with inflation across the board, not just gas. So we proposed this um, and we, we, for six, seven months toward the state, and talk to people, and we were able to get that done. Um, we need it still. Um, gas is still high, um, and that money is better right now in, in the taxpayers' pockets instead of the piggy bank at the Capitol. Um, I am all for saving money and being responsible with money, um, and I think we are in a good financial spot right now due to the legislation that passed um, in 17 when it was tied in the Senate. Um, and I think it makes sense that we pay attention to the needs of our, our families and anything that we can do to reduce the cost of living at this point um, responsibly should be done. Um, I think um, it, it's good that we can continue it, but the phasing out, I would have liked to seen that, um, you know, stay 25 cents till the end instead of phasing it back in. Um, but it, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Um... There wasn't too much resistance <clears throat> resistance to this, was there? So, you know, when we went up there and, and we're going to talk about a few different things, we would have liked the opportunity and we made a motion to divide these because we voted on five different things in one bill. 
Hmm. Um, and, and that happens all too often at the Capitol. People need to pay attention to that. And, and it kind of handcuffs somebody from maybe voting uh, a different way on a certain issue, maybe not even related, could be in two totally different spaces, but they put it in one bill. And that's something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, but we made a motion to divide so we could hear each issue separately and then be able to, to be the voice of our constituents on each issue. That was denied. Um, so I personally believe that my yes vote did more good for the state of Connecticut and the members um, that I represent in the 34th district. So I voted yes for it. And I think that was um, um, the same takeaway from a lot of my colleagues, that it did good, but it could have done better. Yeah. You can't get everything you want. And uh, actually on the Citizen Mike show, we've talked about this before, I think uh, years ago with Senator Fasano, sort of an arm twisting tactic that you're forced to, you know, a lot of things are packaged together and um, it, 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 yeah, it puts, it puts folks in a bad spot. Uh, let me change gears, premium pay. Um, you better start from the beginning on this one because I don't quite get it. I, I don't know how the state's going to identify an essential worker. I, I mean, the, the server at, a, at the breakfast place that I go, go to a lot, how are they going to know if she's an essential worker or not? I, I'm totally confused. <laughs> Help me out here. What's going so on? My, so am I, <laughs> so are a lot of my colleagues up there. You know, um, in theory, it makes sense to reward someone for working hard. And there was a lot of brave men and women that worked in all types of very important uh, uh, careers and jobs. You know, we talk about some of these positions being nurse, doctors, firefighters, um, the grocery store worker, the truck driver. These are very important jobs that, that you know, we don't realize how important they are, especially the latter of the two, the trucking and, and the grocery store clerks. You know, it keeps that wheel turning and getting very uh, important things on, on our, our kitchen tables and in our cabinets from food and medicine and everything else that we need on a daily basis. And we realize that you know, uh, you know, in the beginning uh, of COVID. Um, so I do think in theory, it's a great idea, but it needs to be better planned. Um, and without a proper plan, I don't think we just push forward things because we get into these situations, wh which we're in right now. Um, great idea, but it wasn't thought out well enough. Um, and we're in a situation where too many people applied and then everyone's supposed to get a thousand dollars. And now, you know, if we didn't find more funding, we can talk about that in a minute, um, you know, they would have been getting less than one third of what they thought they would have been getting. Um, to make it work, they had to then put restrictions on. So maybe someone like a firefighter who is definitely, in my opinion, an essential, work, essential worker or a nurse that makes over a certain amount of money, they're not gonna be able to be eligible for um, this, this hero pay or this, um, this program. Um, and I think that that's a problem. I think that's a problem. Well, it's a done deal, isn't it? I mean, it, the legislation's been written, it's passed, it's over, right? The all that, only thing that's left is the chaos, I guess. That uh... Yeah, and that's exactly what it's going to be like. I think it was Vin, Vin Candelora used an analogy of throwing some bread into a pond, a, a duck pond, and everybody, go, you know, they have to go, you know, fast and furious to try to get um, some of that funding. Um, and it's going to, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be interesting to see, um, and I hope it works out well. And, and I hope that people that did work hard and put their, you know, families um, at risk to to help their, you know, their community. Yeah. I just hope it all works out. And and again, all too often you'll see too. Sometimes they bring legislation out of a committee um, before it is ready. Um, and I, I I'm a believer of a simple philosophy: work smarter, not harder. Um, and you know, don't bring something out. Um, if it's not ready. And sometimes they'll say, well, we'll fix it as we're going. Sometimes it doesn't get fixed. And, and, and here's a great example of that. So the, uh, a final final question of this, which betrays my, my confusion. I gather, I infer, I'm not sure, that um, workers have to apply and then they self-declare. Is that how it works, that they're, that they're essential workers? Is, is that? But essentially, yeah, they would apply and put their job title what they do um and then they would be able to be eligible and a lot of different jobs and careers fall within that delivery of you know heating uh, security professional i guess would be considered um um essential you know there was some um regulations of who was classified that could be out and about when we were in those lockdowns so anybody in those professions which there's a lot of them could be considered an essential employee who would be eligible for this program. 
So somewhere there's a list of professions and occupations. Is that how that works? Yes, my understanding that's exactly how that would work. There's the website where you would be able to apply and your your profession would be one of the um, ones in that list. All right, um, I got to check the list. Is a producer of the Citizen Mike Show, do you think? I and mean, that's pretty essential, you know? The reporters are, I don't know, I mean, maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll look, I'll look. Um, change, let's change the subject. Um, Let's talk about I think it's closed though. So I don't I think that point's moot. <laughs> All right. I got you. Um, I want to talk about this past election uh, of 2022. Um, every time I think I have my materials that we're gonna talk about on the show fixed, Donald Trump comes up with something new. And so, you know, it, it gets updated day to day to day to day. Uh, but there's a couple of things I do want to read you to get your take on it. And uh, I want to start first with something that's, um, well, it's uh, several weeks old. It was from the New York Times, just sort of right after the election. Uh, Republicans reckon with midterm election fallout. This is on a national, sort of on a national scale. It said the Republican Party, staring at the worst midterm performance by a party out of power in two decades, traded recriminations on Friday over whether the ultimate cause was poor candidates an overheated message or the electoral anchor that appeared to be dragging the GOP down, former President Donald J. Trump. That's from a November 11 a column uh, in the uh, New York Times. Getting more current, the Hartford Current had a uh, piece of this past week. It starts out, um, when Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, he emerged nationally as the darling of many Republicans who pushed him over the top to victory, skipping down in Connecticut. House Republican leader Vincent Candelora of North Brantford, a fiscally and socially conservative Republican, has deep concerns, quote, just as every fine wine has its day, uh-oh, uh-oh, Vince, I think Trump has turned to vinegar, Candelora said in an interview. Frankly, all the good policies that he has done have been eclipsed by his behavior. Like many people, you cringe with the behavior. I thought it would subside, but it never did. It has only gotten worse. He lashed out not just at Democrats, but equally at Republicans. I just don't think it's a tone that this country needs to continue in the political atmosphere that we're in. Skipping down, overall, Candelora thinks that Republicans simply need to turn the page on Trump. And you know where I'm going with this. In a minute, I'm going to ask you, where do you stand? But let me finish <laughs> reading this. It says, um, Senate Republican uh, leader uh, Kevin Kelly of Stratford holds a similar view, saying the Republicans need a nominee who can serve eight consecutive years. He said it's too early, however, to, to pick one of the, uh, one of the uh, candidates. John McKinney, who later uh, wrote, uh, he's the uh, uh, a former candidate for governor and a, a former Senate Republican from Fairfield, and who later co-authored an, an op-ed. He said, and these are, you know, Republican leadership here, local Republican leadership. He says, I think Donald Trump has done significant damage to the Republican brand here in Connecticut, McKinney told The Current in an interview. I don't want him to run. I think it's time for the Republican Party to move past Donald Trump. I think he is toxic for the party. I think he's toxic for our country, too. I don't want him to be our party nominee. I will not support him. More importantly, I don't think he's good for the country. Changing uh, little articles here. This is the uh, op-ed by John McKinney and Len Fasano. Uh, appeared Sunday, just yesterday, uh, December 4. Part of it says, Trump's refusal to accept the results of the 2020 election, his persistent claims that the election was rigged absent evidence to the contrary, his attempt to overturn the Electoral College results, and his, at worst, incitement of and his, at best, subsequent refusal to quell the violent attack on our Capitol on January 6 make him unfit for office. The anger people had for Trump was taken out on local Republicans running for office. Their historic accomplishments, and here uh, McKinney and Fasano were talking about the Republicans' accomplishments in the state, 
despite being a minority most of the time. He says their um, historic accomplishments, their fierce policy battles, their advocacy for working and middle-class taxpayers didn't matter. People could not see past or beyond the shadow of Trump and local state politics paid the price at the polls. Let me stop there. Sure. Do you so, agree with McKinney, Fasano, Candelora? Where do you stand on all this? Sure. Yes. Yeah, I, I do agree. I do agree. Um, you know, when I was out knocking on doors, speaking to our constituents, you know, that would come up quite often. Um, you know, and as a state senator, we don't have much say of what happens in Washington, D.C. You know, Trump, Pelosi, they're not going to be calling me up asking me for advice on what they're going to do up there. Maybe they should, um, but, you know, they're not. Um, and it definitely has an effect on local politics. You know, I always say, you know, you know I'm a middle of the road guy. Um, you know, I'm a working class guy. Um, I was in a union with the Department of Corrections. My father's a union president. Um, you know, I was brought up a working class Democrat. Um, I'm a middle of the road guy. And I, I tell that to the constituents that say, oh, you're a Republican. You know, you must be, you know, this, that or the other thing. And, and I just try to simply explain and, and, and if they would allow me to talk, which some and most do, um, we would get right back on on a conversation just like this, laughing and talking about the issues that the individuals in Wallingford and in the 34th face, we get by that. But some don't even allow me to explain um, that what's happening up there doesn't have anything to do with us here. And and too many have that, that ideology um, and it, it's, it makes it a little harder to, to have those type of conversations. Um, so I, I agree with, with, you know, all of those, um, leaders, um, that it's time for a change and we need to go in a new direction. Um, let you and I go in a new direction and, and get off the election and Trump for a minute and talk about the future, what's coming up, uh, in the next two years and the next four years, um, what do you have your eye on as far as legislative initiatives you'd like to see, maybe co-sponsor, uh, you know, your legislative aspirations for um, the coming the coming term or two? And the flip side of that coin is, are you wary of any Democratic proposals that you'd want to slow down to loot or, or block? So just give us the overview of your thinking on that. Sure, sure. So... Um, there's definitely some work to be done, and, and I'll talk about the areas that we want to pay attention to and some of the ideas that we have. Um, but um, I think it's important that you know I point out, um, you know, I, I don't put forward too many bills. Um, I see that sometimes um, a, a good a good intention of a bill has unintended consequences all too often. So I'm one um, that less may be more. We create laws. And sometimes there's effects that we don't realize. So um, I try to make sure and, and really figure out how this is going to affect everyone. Um, and, you know, the bills that we will and issues we will pay attention to um, are going to be workforce development, public safety, making it more affordable here. Um, you can say those are all great things. How are you going to do it? Um, but but we have plans and things that we can do, and, and we got to hope that we we have uh, good conversations in our committees and, and and the other side listens, so we're able to, to really put forward good legislation that's going to solve these problems. There's going to be a lot of other bills that do a lot of other things, and I'm sure there's good intention, but we need to figure out how we solve the problems that are affecting our Connecticut residents. Um, it, it's so important that we do that. One of the first bills that I put forward um, my first term was to investigate or look into where we're spending our money and how we could reduce that so we could reallocate it. Because sometimes when you propose legislation, it has a dollar uh, 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 amount, price tag, if you will, attached to it. And there are things that are probably not being used or we get a better deal on and we could reduce the spending before we start increasing our spending. And I'm a, I'm a big believer of that. I do it in my business, my home. I mean, I think we should do it at a state level. Um, for example, how we were able to actually come up with some extra money so um, that the Harrow pay and, and the, um, the bill that we went into for special session could be funded. You know, we saved, I think it was $4.5 million 
um, when it came to the uh, state retirees benefit packages, there was no decrease in benefit. What it was was just shopping around, essentially getting a better price. That savings, we were able to reallocate to fund another program that was needed for our residents. We need to be doing more of that. We need to find a way to save the money um, and then reallocate that for the purposes that we're going to talk about, workforce development, you know, really making sure that we have enough officers on the street and that it's it's safe out there. I hear all too often that people are worried about the rise in crime, the theft that's going on, whether it's the Cadillac converter, the whole car, or they're walking out of CVS and somebody comes rushing by them stealing something. It's real. Um, and I think that that needs to be addressed. That's definitely going to be one of the things on my list of things to pay attention to and to advocate for. And I'm doing that because my constituents are asking me to, you know, my job is to be the voice of everyone, everyone, Republican, Democrat, independent, even if you're not registered to vote, we need to be representing the people that are in our district. And I think that's what I'm going to be doing because that's what I'm hearing them talk about. Uh, I want to talk about, because because you sort of opened the door to this, uh, although we're coming near the end of the show, the, the, the issue of crime and no one likes crime you know i think that's the comment no one likes crime <laughs> and so and i think everyone supports the police although the police might be puzzled uh you know to hear people say that but frankly everyone does they want a everyone wants a police force with you know with good morale with good training with good pay good work i mean we all i think we all want that and those that don't want it we can have another conversation but frankly, here's what I'm seeing around election time. And that is a lot of uh, ginning up of uh, fear and emotions about crime and to get people to vote. And that's the key, you get them to vote on the basis of their emotions. And the people doing the, the ginning up of this fear don't have a lot of substance behind their proposal. Support the police is not a policy proposal. So what are policy proposals? More pay. When that comes out of the Wallingford, you know, budget. So, I, I, you know, maybe the state subsidizes it. I don't know, more officers. I, we'd love to have more officers, love to, and more pay with more training and better equipment. Yeah, we'd love to have that. Um, then there's a school of thought, well, you know, what it really takes, we've got to be tough on crime. And to do that, we have longer sentences and some people doubt whether that really reduces crime because eventually they get out of jail and they're less equipped to integrate into society um, because their job prospects, their education, you know, just isn't working anymore. Um, and then you say, well, you know, we, we've got to try to equip these criminals when they come out to be constructive members of society. And suddenly you're soft on crime. Suddenly that's construed as you're coddling the criminals. I said, no. I'm hard on the, I don't want to be a criminal again, but in order for me to give them tools to survive in a society and not rely on crime, we've got to do something to, 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 to move them along a more healthy, wholesome, wholesome path. So this whole issue of crime, I, personally, I'd like to see less riling up of fear and more constructive proposals. Uh, and I'm, I guess my question to you would be, is there going to be common ground, do you think, with the Democrats in the next two or four years on some uh, criminal justice proposals? Or do you think everybody's too polarized? Well, I really hope that we are able to work together and come up with some solutions. Um, you know, first thing that you said, um, and I've heard that before, that um, the people who talk about the rise in crime are using that as a political way to get votes. Um, and I strongly disagree with that. Um, you know, I am talking to the constituents. I'm talking to my PDs. I'm seeing it. I saw it firsthand. I was in North Haven um, and there was somebody that just literally walked out of TJ Maxx in North Haven with their arms wrapped around a bunch of clothes and different things and just walked right out. And, you know, I'm like, what was that? And I asked the woman that was working there and she said, yeah, he, he was stealing them. Like, are you going to call anyone, do anything? says, no, there's really not much we can do. We'll, we'll call the police. There's a video camera. We'll report it, but there's not much we can do. It happens all the time. Um, I get calls all the time about something happening when it comes to violent crime or theft. 
Um, so I don't think that this is something that is um, being made up um, in any means. There is a rise in crime um, and we have to address it. Um, and we came up with a, a plan um, to address that. It's a safer CT, it's, it's on our website. Um, and, and we're trying to solve the problem before it becomes a problem, if that makes sense. Um, I agree with you that we don't lock someone up and throw away a key. People make mistakes, but the people who continue to make those same mistakes with no consequences, they feel almost emboldened to continue to do it because there's no reason not to do it. You know, I really believe that, you know, we need to start paying attention to these kids that are, are committing these crimes when they're in elementary school. You know, I talked to teachers that say 10 years ago, if a student told me, um, swore at me, I won't use the term, um, and, and you know, maybe threw something, uh, a book on the ground and said some swear words, um, they would be suspended. You know, now the kids don't get suspended. Um, they, um, they'll get taken out of the class for the day. They fill out a, a form. The teacher now has to do a little bit more work. Um, fill out a form, they'll come back the next day and, and they'll have a mediation of how do we solve this problem? So that the, the student who may have interrupted the class for I don't know how long until they went to the principal office will come back to the classroom that next day. Might I add, he will go back to the next class um, the same day and there's no consequences. And I think that we need to start to pay attention to that, that there needs to be consequences for actions. Um, I'm not saying throw the kid out of school forever, and I'm not saying lock someone up and throw away a key when they make mistakes, but there has to be consequences for your actions because these problems are going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that I'm not fear mongering. I'm not making this up. I'm hearing it from the police chiefs in the area. And again, the constituents are calling us all the time. There was a business that got their catalytic converters robbed for the third time. And the insurance won't even cover it anymore. I think it was a it's a small bakery. You know, this is it, it's a problem. And I just don't think that we turn a blind eye blind eye to it. No, no one's saying that. No one is saying a turn a blind eye. Uh, and I and I'm not saying crime is not a problem. What I what I was saying, and let me just clarify that, is that too often during elections, uh people uh, candidates use the crime card, but they don't have another card in their hand, which says, here are the specific consequences that are we're willing to fund, that are constitutional, that is uh, proven to be effective. Uh, so they play the one card, the fear card, but the other card uh, too often just isn't there. So I'm, I would be looking for in the next two years, four years, these specific, meaningful consequences that are going to do more than just sate the appetite of folks for, you know, revenge or punishment. Uh, we all believe in consequences. Uh, we, 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 we really do. I think that the police under, and we, we have in our system, uh, the right to bail, you know, so you get arrested and you sign a promise to appear and you're entitled to get out. That's constitutional law. There's not too much you can do about it. You talk about school suspensions, the Board of Ed gets involved, and that becomes very tricky, uh, an interplay between the Board of Ed and educational policy and the criminal justice system. I'm just raising complications because I think it's a nuanced a nuanced issue, but I'm as interested in solving it as you are. So I'm going to give you the... Yeah, go ahead. I wholeheartedly agree with what you just said, um, that you know it's very easy to point out a problem um, and, and talk about why it's not good. Um, but I think it's it's imperative that you come up with the solutions when you point something out. Do it at home with my kids, right? If they say they don't want that for dinner, well, what do you want? Let's let's have a conversation, right? Or you you know you know in my business, hey, this could be done better, or I don't like the way this is happening. Well, show me a better way, and we can do that. And we did that. Um, we do have a better way, um, and, and it's on the website, and it talks about you know how to address these issues, and it's not just with penalty, you know. There's workforce development pipelines to get kids that are, you know, thinking that there is no other option than a minimum wage job, you know, show them that, you know, they could be out coming out of high school and, and getting into a trade and being paid while they're going to school to learn a trade, come out as a plumber or an electrician making, you know, $80,000, $90,000 a year. Um, and, and there are a lot of ways that we could address these issues. And we have, we have a way, and we just need to, 
um, have a really frank conversation of the issues um, that are, are, are facing the people committing the crimes and the challenges that the officers have while trying to do their job. Uh, and if we can do that and, and just be situationally based on problems and not party, I, 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 I'm optimistic that we could come up with those solutions, but we really need to uh, be frank about what these issues are. And, and part of the problems come from the criminal justice bill, the accountability bill. Um, um, it's not all of the problems. Um, the crime may still be um, high or, or getting higher, um, but this definitely um, multiplied the effect of the, the, the rise in crime. You know, and again, I'm hearing this from the officers. Um, there are things that are in that bill that, that may not allow the officers to do their job uh, effective, effectively and quickly. Um, and, and we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing it. So I think it's a conversation that has to be had. We have ideas and we would love to talk about it. And that's what I plan on doing. You know, I'm on public safety and judiciary um, and I'm gonna continue to advocate for these good ideas that are gonna help people, um, help the general public first and foremost. We need to help the everyday person, right? We need to make sure it's safe for everyone. But we also wanna make sure that we have options for the individuals that are committing these crimes, stop them before they commit them, or if they do commit them and they get incarcerated, that we give them the options to good paying jobs when they come out. And, and we did do that. And there was some legislation this year that addresses that and, and, and helps individuals uh, um, find meaningful employment and get careers coming out of jail. But in the same token, you know, we can't fund um, or give money to somebody that's getting out of prison and then not help the person that didn't get in trouble that wants to go do the same program but has to pay but doesn't have the funds to do so. So again, we need to do it with balance and look at things um, um, situationally and, and address them um, appropriately. Let's make that the final word because you're running out of time and you opened a lot of doors there and we just don't have time to go into it. But you can expect from me, yes you can, another invitation to the Citizen Mike Show further down the line when some of these specific ideas come out or don't come out and hopefully, uh, you know, you'll be back on the screen and we'll be getting more specific about some of these things. And uh, I'm 99.9% .9 confident you and I can find common ground. Everybody else, I have no idea, uh, but <laughs> we'll sort it out. Uh, Paul Ciccarella, thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show. It has been a blast. We do appreciate it. Hope to see you again soon. And viewers, thanks to Paul. And thank you for watching the Citizen Mike Show, where the show is up on YouTube, shows up on uh, WPAA, uh, generally weeknights at 9 p.m. And everyone, have a happy holiday season. And to you also, Paul, have a good holiday. Thank you so, so long. Much. See you again.